Tere kuulema algoritmi, täna on 30. juuli ja jälle oleme koos oma Squadcasti virtuaalses studios. Mina olen Tiit Paanen Verifist ja minu koos võib saada, et Priit Liivak Noortalis. Tere Priit! Tere, tere! Ja täna sa saate teema on No Code, Low Code, mis on tugev trend sellel aastal ja ka varasematel aastatel. Ja meil on selleks külas Matteja Sponsa Microsoftist. Ja esmakordselt teeme siis selle saate inglise keeles. So, uh, let's switch to English. And uh, uh, so, about English, so we received some feedback from our users telling us that uh, about 30% of our listeners would be completely okay if some of the episodes would be in English. So, also this opens up uh, as a possible new audience segments. So, uh, Stay tuned, maybe in future we're going to have more foreign guests and uh, run the episode in English. So, so here we is a warm... We don't plan to switch, uh, uh, switch entirely to English, at least at first. But uh, let's, let's call this a trial episode. There you go. Uh, so here is a warm welcome to our guest, Matteo Sponsa. Welcome to the show and uh, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and what you have and are doing right now. Hello. Uh, so first of all, thank you for uh, hosting me. Uh, it's been a true pleasure to be a guest uh, in your uh, show. Uh, and regarding our listeners, uh, hello. So I'm uh, Matea Sponza. Uh, I'm a software engineer and uh, engineering manager in uh, Microsoft. I've been uh, with the company for eight years, maybe more. Uh, initially, I joined Skype and I've been here through the transition from Skype to Microsoft and uh, stayed in the company ever since. And uh, throughout the years, I've been working on many different products. I was uh, working on uh, Skype Wi-Fi. It was very dear to my heart. Um, I worked on uh, different Skype clients uh, back end. And uh, currently I'm an engineering manager in a team that uh, works on payment infrastructure and related services. So pleasure to be here. Mm-hmm. And we have and, an exciting topic. Uh, what did you do before Skype? Before Skype, uh, I was uh, mainly, for a majority of time, working in a company called Smith Micro. And uh, I was working on uh, uh, platform level and uh, system level engineering. Uh, we were building a cross-platform frameworks uh, that worked on embedded devices. At the time, uh, embedded devices that had very little resources available to application and then our layer had even less every cpu cycle that we consume or memory that we consume was you know cpu less uh, for the app and on here top you, you are actually... talking something even less powerful than uh, and then those embedded small platforms like arduino and uh, uh, what's the other raspberry raspberry pi well something similar you know at, at the time so so current silicon is much powerful than uh, silicon uh, back then uh, and uh, and then uh, I switched to, to Skype and basically started to work on uh, application level engineering. And uh, uh, many years later, here we are. Mm. So currently you are engineering manager, but you are an enge- engineer at heart. So that's, I guess, um, very good intro to, the, to our topic because uh, while it is an engineering topic, uh, low code, no code, I mean, it is actually something that uh, is more more relevant for wider audiences. So it's good to have engineer to talk about it. And uh, maybe if you, we should, uh, to start with, we should scope a little bit uh, the the topic itself uh, because it's, it's really a wide area. And uh, I see it uh, basically in, in two perspectives. One is that um, we have those... Uh, integration and automation environments and services that just uh, uh, translate the API layer to human language step-by-step integration capabilities. And then we have uh, actual full app development environments that enable you to develop uh, both front-end and back-end uh, services uh, to, to without actually heavy coding. So. So is there any other sort of categorization you guys can think of or this is it? 
I just actually realized that uh, CI systems, continuous integration systems, have been low code um, a decade. So th they have been pretty much always low code. And uh, it's, it's some kind of pioneering, them, actually. Yeah. P pioneers. And, and, and uh, some of them, like uh, Bamboo, for example, was from the get go uh, kind of a drag and drop uh, way of doing things. And the one I think ThoughtWorks is pushing, I can't remember the name again. I think I'm, I'm having trouble with names today. Um, the one that ThoughtWorks is pushing is, is also very much UI, UI based and UI intensive. So that's, that's kind of a, it's, it's been always close to us, but now we're talking about using low code in actual kind of, um, building software other than software directed for software developers, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the other view on, on it, uh, I guess, is, uh, and that's my own theory, but uh, I predict what's going to happen is that all those um, people who were moved to office last 30 years and uh, started to create documents and exchange information, and they are transitioning into creating services rather than documents. Um, they are automating their, their own work to, to, be mo to do more meaningful work uh, and uh, automate mundane tasks. And for that, they are creating services, uh, which leads to um, one of the topics that we already touched in algorithm as well, which is sort of a service traffic pollution in internet. So uh, Sergey from Pipedrive made a good example that they are actually receiving a lot of outdated Zapier requests, uh, which basically um, pollutes their incoming traffic and they need to do something about it. So so it's, it's an interesting area from that angle as well that um, more people are starting to go and less control over it will actually be a reality we go into. I can give a bit of context of uh, present time and estimated future time. So, so and uh, why no code, low code platform is important for software industry in general and other industries actually. So, uh, Microsoft estimated uh, that in the next five years, we will create, we as a software industry uh, as a whole, will create about 500 million applications. Uh, Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, actually presented this in uh, Microsoft uh, in Fire. Uh, and uh, humans are bad with large numbers. So to put into perspective, what does 500 million applications mean? Uh, it actually means that in next five years, we will make more applications than humans have created since the beginning of time. Uh, so that's how large this number is. Mm -hmm. and, and when uh, AI kicks in, that's, that gets, uh, mm -hmm. the number AI, gets AI, even bigger, right? Yeah, AI is an important part of it. And we will touch it in our talk uh, a bit later on. Uh, but this comes with an interesting consequence. It turns out that there are not enough software engineers to do it. So if you take into account all the software engineers, professional software engineers that exist today, and all of the students that will finish schools year after year for the next five years, combined uh, will not be enough to produce uh, this amount of uh, applications. So this was, this was Microsoft's prediction, right, to have yes. that there will be 500 million yes. applications being built. New ones. Yeah. And it it was a prediction with the understanding that there are not enough software developers out there yes. who can build these to things. do it. Yeah, this this the so need. The, so that, but the, the, we we have a part on how to get there. Uh, so so that's I, I'll I'll switch to the how to get there, but to give uh, more weight on like why is this so? Uh, we so that was a view to the future, but we let's let's look at the present time. So current year, we're not talking now in about like year 2030 or like this present calendar year, uh, 2020, uh, there will be three times more software engineers hired in auto industry than mechanical engineers. Now think about this number. 
auto industry has been industry where historic that historically has been you know, almost entirely uh, focused on mechanical engineers at one point of time even entirely but this year there will be three times more software engineers hired in auto industry than uh, mechanical engineers so so e- basically it gives you a hint that every company is switching to be a software company regardless of their original industry. And then we come to a, another problem is, okay, large companies have um, uh, IT departments and resources, but what about small and medium businesses? How are they going to make this transition to digital? Uh, small and medium businesses don't have IT departments. They, they don't have resources to hire software engineers. And you know, by the numbers that we mentioned earlier, potentially there won't be even a software engineer to hire. Uh, so Microsoft and other leaders in the industry are actually investing heavily for some time to solve this issue. Mm-hmm. And so far, I, I think one of the solutions has been to uh, try and build these kind of specialized platforms that can be sold as services to these industries. Uh, I personally know several of, uh, of these um, some tools like uh, organizing uh, documents and plans, especially designed for construction industry and uh, uh, kind of construction design and kind of overseeing the projects and doing these kind of auditing for uh, for these kind of construction projects. And and since this uh, solution is so specialized, uh, that makes it useful for the industry for the um, even the smaller companies who are uh, working in that industry because uh, it kind of um, touches some specific points that other generic document management uh, solutions wouldn't touch. So that makes it useful, uh, but it also makes it only usable in that industry. So it's not the generic uh, yeah. solution. Yeah. So uh, I can bring an example from a small business uh, as uh, here you see the IT department of Pohjala Brewery. <laughs> uh, and uh, while I've been doing some coding and uh, sort of administrator work in the past, uh, I'm not doing it right now. Uh, but um, uh, actually, the one of the main principles or a couple of main principles about Pohjala IT strategy is that everything should be cloud-based and uh, nothing should cost anything. <laughs> so basically, we should get... Um, a squeeze out of uh, maximum out of the free tiers and free offerings and uh, open source software and uh, that everything should be deployed to the cloud infrastructure so we didn't we wouldn't have to worry about service servers and backups and whatnot so um, at least you have an IT strategy well that's well yeah you can call it one yes <laughs> yeah, I think it's a pretty decent one you have yes Very so good kind of focus uh which leads me to to sort of a weird dilemma not dilemma but almost like um i haven't yet figured out what it means but uh, uh from my experience i've been building uh small automation uh, applications uh, services uh, uh, dashboards to Pohjala, for Pohjala and uh, uh, I've been doing that mostly just by following the documentation, uh, deploying software, uh, updating, uh, creating databases, uh, writing queries, uh, uh, deploying new platforms uh, for data warehouse purposes, uh, doing Google app uh, uh, scripts, uh, simple HTML, uh, jQuery based uh, dashboards for screens, etc. So. Um, very simple things done by a person who has some background in IT, but is not currently a developer, uh, just focusing and reading documentation and via trial and error, basically getting to the solution. Uh, and, uh, I see that this, uh, this is doable for many, many people. And they have not realized that this is actually a possibility. And they have this fear of not being able to do it. But that fear also keeps them not opening the 
the documentation and starting to follow it, you know. Uh, launching an instance in Amazon and blo- deploying a couple of uh, open source uh, platforms to that instance is just uh, so simple and uh, you let step by step uh, by documentation. So uh, I, I think that there will be an explosion where people start to realize that this is, is actually possible. Mm. So that's, that's actually like where we are heading to. Uh, so our our pro, like our approach to solving this uh, this problem or like improving the situation is actually somewhere in between uh, what what you said. So we, we create we we coined a new term uh, it's called citizen developers. So that describes a new generation of app creators. And the idea here is that uh, we have low code and no code platforms that will enable professionals from other industries to automate their workflows and and generate their internal uh, applications. Uh, And this will actually offload professional software engineers uh, to tackle more complex problems. So so the idea is that professional software engineers will create infrastructure and systems upon which the rest of the software uh, industry will be um, built upon. Um, And no code and low code platforms are are not something new. Uh, they've been with us for a while, but as you mentioned in the intro, there has recently been a bit of explosion in the usage, and and there is a reason for it, uh, and that's another technical breakthrough that recently has happened, and that's the AI. You know, now now you're like, what does AI have to do with it? Uh, it has to do a lot. The best definition, uh, human understandable and definition of AI that I ever. Uh, got was was this in traditional software engineering you have input data and then software engineer goes and arranges if and else statements and for loops to transform this input into desired output so you need to have a professional software engineer that knows to arrange uh, uh, statements so that we get desired outcome now in AI based uh, uh, systems you just need to specify to the computer what is desired output for the given input. So what happens is that a user comes and says, for this data, this is what I want. And for this other data, this is what I want. And then computer is the one that goes and arranges these if and else statements in appropriate order so that for this input, there is an output. This is a bit of simplification, but for all intents and purposes, it is what it is. And, so and Microsoft Power Apps is, is already doing that? Exactly. Or not yet? So, yes, exactly. So, so that's the deal. Uh, with the AI, when, we, when AI has came to a point where we can embed AI components into a low-code or no-code platform, and the promise is that AI will give the power to the platform, but keeping the simplicity of it. So historically, no-code and low-code platforms had two issues. Basically, they were either too simple so that you couldn't, it's easy to use, but you couldn't tackle real life, you know, Puchiala brewery complex workload, or they were very powerful, but then they were too complex and you actually needed to be a software engineer to use it, which defeats the purpose. Now, the, the promise that AI brings to the table is that we can make those simple, uh, uh, systems very powerful while keeping the simplicity. And and to test this, because it's kind of marketing, you know, talk, uh, I went on and uh, said, okay, you know, can I build an app uh, with this system? And uh, I, for a long time, I wanted to build an app that's called Find My Cat, you know, and the, the application, what it needed to do, it's very generic. Like you will see how it actually is applied into real life scenarios. The idea is that a, a system should scan the environment. And if it finds my cat, not any cat, but my cat, it, it should send me a notification. That's that's the requirement. And then I added two more. You know, it needs to be done in a couple of hours uh, because you know we don't have much time. And it needs to be done by a person that is not a software engineer. So so we limited ourselves to a, let's say an average Excel user. So not a complete random person on the street, but if you know how to use Excel, there shouldn't be any concept. Uh, unknown to. And, and platform that I'm 
deeply familiar with this Microsoft Power Platform that is a low-code, no-code environment. And you know, I've laid uh, in the in the links in this talk, I'll actually uh, leave the uh, link to the source no code <laughs> of the solution <laughs> no uh, with step by step in instructions uh, on how to create it so so the applicate without any programming we teach the program to find the cat in a in an image stream and so to what, send the what steps email. you go through what, what steps you so, go through to so do you that? train yeah so first you start by, by training a model and that this sounds complex uh, basically you're showing pictures to a computer and marking this is the cat I this want. This is my and cat. This is, yes, and this is not my cat. And this is the cat I want, and this is not my cat. Uh, and computer then says, okay, so let me calculate this. I'll create a program that's going to output for any time your cat appears, I'm going to say, hey, your cat. And any time other cat appears, I'm going to say, not your cat. Uh, and, and okay, so you, you show it input of 50 images, preferably, but even 15 works. Like we are at this point of time that just 15 images of your cat will be sufficient for uh, many cases. Yeah, because uh, AI probably can identify cat that just needs some additional features additional, to identify correct, the because cat. It relies, yeah, it relies on vast knowledge that we've created so far. Uh, and then it, it gives you a program, basically. It says, when you give it an image, it's going to return, is it your cat or not? And next step is that you connect an email notification to it with the Power Apps platform. So, so Power Apps allows you to make a plot, make an app that runs on a mobile phone or on a browser or even on a camera itself. And it's gonna take the stream, runs it through your program, basically through the model that computer generated, reads what computer said, and then sends an email. And you do this with drag and drop and connecting the arrows without programming. And, and truly an average Excel user can can use it. Uh, why? Because in the same way, you can think about machine learning, or in your case, machine teaching. You are teaching a machine what to do. You can think about it similar as teaching a child to catch a ball. Now, to catch a ball is a complex task, and you don't need to be a, a neural, ne neural doctor or neural scientist to figure out in, in which part does the brain calculate? Like the eyes need to focus for the distance of the ball. Does it go to conscious level or unconscious level? Then the, the, the brain needs to position the arms to catch the ball without looking at the arms. Like how does the brain calculate the angle of the wrist position of the hands when not looking? You don't know this, but you know how to teach a child to catch a ball. How? You throw it a slow ball. If you throw a fast ball, you can't teach a child. But you know intuitively, okay, we start easy. I throw a slow ball, child fails, I throw again, child fails, and then 15 times later, child catches it. You don't need to be a neural scientist to, to teach a child how to catch a ball. In the same way, you don't need to be a data scientist to teach a computer to identify a cat. And it needs approximately similar time of repetition. So 15 images and computer is like, okay, I can, you know, recognize a cat or catch almost any ball. And then you bring 35 more and then computer is like, I'm very confident. <laughs> I know, and, and that's I know the beauty we're, of uh, kind of, we're recording a podcast, but let's, let's try to step into the UI for a moment here. So how does it, for a user, how does it look like to build something like that? So first I probably define some sort of input and that's kind of a, I don't know, a camera input uh, uh, that displays the environment or shows the environment to the application itself, right? Then I'm going to define something else that's, uh, I don't know, identifying an object, some some logic. I need to look for an object from there, or how does that go? So think about in the same way, so I'm, I'm making a parallel to teaching a child a sport, because it's very similar, teaching a computer a sport of doing tasks. So, so when you start with teaching a child how to play a game, you start from the core concept, which is, you know, you need to catch a ball. Like you don't start with the rules, like, okay, this is the court and the, if the ball goes out. Like, so, so in this case, it's the same. We start at the core of the problem. The core of the problem for this demo app is to identify a cat. So we start with the model. Like first we need to know, are we even able to build this before tackling like, you know, cameras and whatnot. So how does it look like from user interface? 
like you, you go to a web page. It's a portal that says computer vision. <laughs> and, and it's part of Microsoft Cognitive Services. And you say, hey, I want a new model. And it says, here you go. So it guides you with truly, you know, next, 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 I agree, steps uh, uh, kind just, of visa. Uh, does it, uh, do you have to specify what the model is for or it auto detects it? So, so when you start to train a model, you can actually uh, streamline it. So you have object detection. That's like it, uh, the detect a cat or, or a different type or a car on a picture. You have a form detection. That's for automating your invoice. It's like you can take a paper invoice with, with data in it and it's going to detect what are the line items. Here is the sum. Here is the VAT and stuff like this. And you have general purpose one, which is like, okay, like, you know, you, you, you go and train. So, so there is basically things. There is basically a photo, photo computer vision model sort of start point. Then there is an OCR mm -hmm. readout start point, And then... Yes. There is also decision. Decision is very exciting. Like you can, uh, you can feed it preconditions for your for known outcomes of your business. Like whatever time of the day when the purchase was started, who, like the client's history. Doesn't matter. Like all the different aspects without you directly knowing which aspect influences on the outcome, and it can give you a decision. Like you know, we estimate true or false for the new one. Uh, but why I start with the computer vision? Because it's so easy for humans to understand. The others are dealing with digits and tables, and it's not intuitive. Like, okay, you know, you, you had a number 500, and now you have number 800. Even though it's kind of breakthrough, breakthrough you don't net intuitively understand. But when you work with computer vision, that's where I advise anyone to start. It's nice because you, he you see images and boxes on the images and it's intuitively uh, understandable what just happened. So let me go back to the, how the actual flow goes. So the wizard guides you and says, okay, you are creating a new model. Which one do you want? Form detection, object detection, and, and stuff that we discussed. You say object detection. Image classification is also an option. It doesn't matter. We say object detection. It says, okay, please upload 15 to 50 images that contain or not contain. And at that point, the, the user says, oh my God, where do I get 50 images of my cat? Data <laughs> is gold. So data is the new currency. And that's why it's so important. That's why all the privacy... So take photographs that is of happening. everything <laughs> from that, several that's why angles. The privacy, privacy is so important uh, uh, because, of, because the data is actually currency. Because the data provides value when it's put through a machine learning model. And that's why you need to be in control of your data so that others would not monetize it. And it's, it's fairly easy now to monetize. Even a person that is not a software engineer can do it. Because if you substitute, so I was playing around and said, okay, find my cat. But in essence, it can be anything. It can be find my car or find my person you you understand how how where where this can go that's why the find privacy, the person that owes me money that's why privacy <laughs> is so important that's why trust is so important uh, those are cons those are those are things that that we focus on heavily uh, so so how does it go you upload images and then the software guides you image by image it says okay mark your object you're like here is my cat next image here is my cat and after third Initially, you'd even need, you'd draw the rectangles. But, but after the third one, the computer already is kind of confident and says, you, when it opens next one, it says, I think it's here. You just need to say yes or no. So, so And then it, it turns out, yes, 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 no. I need to correct. Yes, 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 next. And, and you are done. You say, train a model. And after you know, an hour or so, you get the program that actually outputs, is it your cat or not? And now what you can do with this model, it's opened as a REST interface for all the software engineers, but it's also opened, you can download the model. You can download the simplified version of your model and execute it on your device. Like you don't even need to be connected to internet. You can download it to your phone and run it however you want, how much you want on your web camera. Or you can expose it to Power Apps platform. That's where we, that's the topic of our uh, 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 that's the topic of our uh, episode today. So when you expose it to Power Up platform, you've got this program available in, in uh, 
you know, what, what you see, what you get, user interface application creation tool. You As use a your mouse to drag boxes and buttons on the screen, and you literally connect with the mouse saying, here is OK button. When I press OK button, I want an image to be taken from a camera and uh, give it to the program that is connected. Give it to my model to tell me, is there my cat or not? And once the result comes out, you connect next arrow to say, OK, what do you do with this result? Well, you say, if yes, then send email. If no, yeah, that's that's the part I already understand. I'm thinking that usually for users, um, th this kind of linear way of thinking is the most uh, common way of starting to solve the problems. So they are thinking, oh, I have a camera set up somewhere. Uh, I can I can use that as an input, uh, and then they're like, okay, now how does that? Uh, how do I identify the cat from that camera image? And now kind of this is where they usually get stuck. It's like they, they want somebody to recommend them, um, hey, you can build this AI model to help you identify your cat from the image. Mm. Try this. Mm -hmm. So this is the point where, where I often see people get stuck when, when using these kind of solutions. So to help a bit uh, in the links of this, uh, episode, uh, th there will be uh, uh, links to step-by-step -step instruction along with, you know, you take your mouse and click here, click there on how to create Find My Cat app and also how to create even more complex one that if we have time, we will touch uh, in, in the episode. And uh, then once, once the, you know, this simple... I just found Teet's cat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you saw it. You saw yeah. it. Yeah. She's walked 19 years old. <laughs> <laughs> she walked slowly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that's a convenient. So, so this, this, this app is like kind of joke or funny app, but it, you modify it very easily to be very useful. For example, instead of taking uh, images of the cat, you can run a store and take images of your shelf. And in the same way how you train a uh, model to this find a cat, it can find products on your shelf. And and you can reverse the logic and say, if you don't find a product, send me an email. What does it mean? Well, the products went off the shelf and you have automated system suddenly that notifies you, hey, chips are out. You know, just go and refill the chips. And the beauty of it is that it can be done in a matter of hours. And it doesn't need for you to hire software engineers. It doesn't need uh, that you buy expensive software, like the mentioned, you can do it without being a software engineer, with being just a shop owner uh, and knowing your way around Word and emails. Uh, in the similar UI, uh, you will click uh, through the wizard and it's going to give you a model and it will help you create an app that actually notifies you when chips are out. And that's so beautiful. for me, the, these kind of low code solutions has have been very useful for integrating different bits and pieces together, already existing bits and pieces. And I know Deet has been using it the same way. Um, and uh, I this morning I looked up a solution I uh, drag and drop together in 2015. Uh, I was experimenting with IBM's Node Red. And it's kind of a more, um, more kind of hardware-oriented, uh, uh, low-code uh, solution and platform for kind of passing all kinds of events uh, throughout your system. So you, you receive an event, you do something with it, you push it somewhere else. So this kind of you build this uh, processing chain. So what I did with that was um, um, on on after spe on specific schedule. Uh, I requested the health check endpoint of uh, solution of the of the application, and if it responded something else than two hundred OK, then I sent a push bullet request. I sent a request to push bullet to notify my phone to send a push notification to my phone uh, so that something is going on. So I Beautiful. essentially built this kind of small uh, monitoring solution, but. I, I don't actually see this kind of solution being built for something um, too much bigger. So, what kind of kind of it's, these big solution examples mm -hmm. you can bring us yeah. that it's, has it's, been 
built with it's this kind of low-code solutions. It's beautiful intro to our second topic. So second example I wanted to bring up uh, is actually a cooperation uh, with a colleague of ours, Levo Sepp. Uh, so what is it about? Levo is an extreme sportsman, and he wanted to, to make a system that uh, tracks him during a competition or, or during uh, an adventure and uh, tracks his position, location, and publishes it to a portal where his friends and family can, you know, see that he's okay, that where is he located, how far far is he progressing, especially if he's on multi-week hiking through different mountain ranges or something. And, And he built a beautiful solution based on Azure serverless compute that costs very little money or no money almost to run it uh, uh, on that small load. Uh, but during our cooperation, I, I stopped and said, hey, Levo, but this can be done without code, with no code, uh, truly. So, so what I set and built is location tracking system for a runner. And it's based on Garmin you know, location notifications tracking. Garmin has uh, its own system, nothing related to low-code, no-code. It's like completely third-party, non-related system. Hmm. And, yeah, so and that's then, a service that just provides you an API which you can it's, use. It's hardware. Ba- yes, it, it, it's basically service that connects the hardware. So, so Levo has Garmin GPS tracker. It integrates to the Garmin system. And Garmin exposed an API intended for developers. But I, I then said, and well, no, de- uh, per people that are not developers can actually use it. So, so we we went and created a server, server application that that interacts with Garmin system in real time, fetches the data, transforms it, and stores it into a database. And the server application is built with seventy two mouse clicks. It's astonishing. So you can finish it in a day. And once you get the data in the database, you don't even know what database is. It's like, you know, well, I store it somewhere. Now is where the magic happens. Because then when the data is in the database, there is a question of how do you display it? There is Power BI that, that is meant to display arbitrary data by a non-data scientist. So you don't need to be a data scientist to plot charts to understand the tables. Yeah, basically Power self-service, BI, self-service yes. environment. Yeah. Power, Power BI is part of Microsoft Power Platform. It's used to then visualize this data. You connect it to a database saying, well, you know, here is some data. I don't actually know how, how it's stored. And it goes and says, oh, okay. So it's spatial data. I can plot it on a map. And it displays you a map with dots. And it's beautiful. Okay. But it sits inside of Power BI. Like, what can you do with it? Then, like, it's three clicks away to publish this data to be available from a web page. With my, I'm, I'm familiar with Microsoft Stacks just as a consequence of my interest. Uh, you, you, you can translate whatever I'm saying with the Power Platform to any other industry leader, they probably have a similar solution, but I'm just focused on Power Platform because I'm I'm familiar with, I know how it it goes. So what I'm I'm saying is that you can then publish this map to a website created with Power Apps, Power Apps Portal, and the application even allows, uh, framework allows you to say, is it a public website or it's a private website? Basically, do you need authentication or not? You don't need to deal with it, how it is done. It is done correctly by by people who knows how to do it. That's what they are doing for their uh, main business focus. Your main focus is to you know, publish location. You don't, you're not interested about how authentication works. So in Lavo's case, it's published as a private one. Like you need to sign in. Why? Because it's intended for his friends and family. But in my case, it's published as a public one because I'm interested in just, you know, like, during a competition to publish my location for anyone to see. Uh, so you, you got it on a website and, and you got it in three or four clicks. Now, also in the links of this episode, uh, there will be a step-by-step instruction on how to create your server using Power Automate or Logic Apps in 72 clicks. And that but anyone I want can do to, it. Like the- I want to actually take it even further. So let's, uh, this is kind of a visualizing my, my own location. Uh, but I think it was, um, 
it might have been like nine or 10 years back when we were um, helping a customer to build a solution for a country where a lot of trucks get hijacked. So trucks get hijacked, they are taken somewhere on an alley, they are emptied out because the trucks are kind of difficult to make uh, make into money, but the goods are really kind of easy to sell and uh, they're dumped essentially. But how to track this kind of fleet, like fleet tracking, yeah. where you have uh, I don't know, hundreds of trucks, you have a UI, you have some operators who are monitoring it, you have a possibility to uh, I don't know, trigger an immobilizer on a truck or lock the doors or do something like that, mm-hmm. like uh, bring up an alert and send police in uh, and, and all, all kinds of this, this kind of activities. Yeah. This already becomes a much, much larger problem. And I understand that it, it is possible to automate something like this with, with low-code solutions. Uh, for me, as a developer, it introduces a whole new set of problems. Uh, one being, for example, test environments. How do I kind of have multiple environments of the same thing so I can... I don't know, add on new features without breaking the existing ones and test them out. So, so the, the, I saw you got I really see. excited about this kind of yeah. scope increase. <laughs> yeah, why? Because in the same way as we increased the scope of Find My Cat, Find My Cat on its own didn't do much useful, but then the store example started to bring value. In the same way, after we have you know location tracking using Garmin systems for a sports event, you can expand the system to actually be fleet tracking. So instead of tracking a single person, you have multiple people. And then if we take the learning of, for example, sending an email from Find My Cat, you can say, so uh, imagine a person is running a transport business. So there is there are trucks or vans that needs to leave the warehouse and reach the client in a agreed time. So, so you, you actually have this data and you can say an alert, well, if truck, is not at client's location at 9 a.m. that we agreed. Send me a notification, send me an email so that I can call the customer and say, hey, sorry, you know, here is the location of the truck. It will be there in five minutes. And that's, that's like reacting on a consequence. But then if you have the system running, you can say, wait, I can prevent failures. Why? Because I need, I know that from my warehouse to the client, uh, the van drives approximately one hour. If the van didn't leave the warehouse, by eight, send me notification. It means there is some holdup. You don't know what. Maybe they have problem in the warehouse. Maybe the driver forgot. So you can prevent failures in in really small amount of time. And, and you get the notification, hey, it's eight, truck hasn't left. It's going to be late at the clients. You call instantly a driver, say, hey, what's up? Can you depart and, and what? But the beauty of it is that in traditional software engineering, to build this kind of system, I actually made a case study of how much it would cost this example system, uh, this this example uh, to be built with with like van um, uh, fleet and delivery uh, to be built as a startup. Like I, I, I'm not a software engineer, then I, I come, come with an idea and I need to hire engineers, I need to get servers, host cloud, get computers and whatnot. And it's a you know, multi-month or, multi- or even a year worth of project before you even get to interact with clients to see, do they really want this? With low-code and no-code platform, so for me to make the the, uh, sports tracking sample, it took about three days, basically almost two weekends. And and I know what I'm doing. So then somebody else maybe can make it in two weeks. That's reasonable with the learning curve. But in two weeks, you got an application that you already can give to your end user and get the feedback on it and improve, iterate and improve faster without hiring a team of engineers to do it. It's, it's like a startup dream come true. Uh, but because it's targeted at professionals in other industries, it's not even meant for startup. It's meant for a transportation company employee even. Yeah, you understand? So that's the beauty of it. In, in a very small amount of time, you can make a product that you can actually integrate in your system and try it out or give it to your users 
for them to try it out and they give you instant feedback hey this works this doesn't let's improve that and this through these rapid iterations you will actually in a small amount of time reach a, a pretty good product because you will improve based on feedback and the cost of the system is silly because Carmin location tracking device was the only cost associated. That's the only hardware needed. And it's the actual it's, cost. Yeah. And and it's 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 you know like even less than a couple of hundreds of euros. That that's a smaller investment than buying a PC. And everything else is what uh, Teet mentioned also, hosted in the cloud, uh, based on usage. And when you when you are building it and when you have small amount of user, there, there is small amount of usage and and it costs really nothing to mm. run it like so a just a month. put it into perspective uh, understand uh, with power apps uh, was it million transactions or, or so uh, so to put it, it the 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 uh, azure serverless compute azure functions have approximately i think uh, 1 million transaction monthly that just executed for free <laughs> like th- this is the load we are talking about and there, and after this, it's like built like insignificant uh, amount of uh, cents, euro cents. So this actually helps. It's meant helps that the platform is meant focus to a different place. For, for me, it, it seems it helps to put a, a focus on a different place. I mean, it introduces a new set of problems, like the problems of test environments, like maintainability of uh, really large solutions, how to document all of this, but. The on upside, you get everything up and running really fast. You can get the feedback loop uh, moving on faster. Uh, in in some occasions, if you're uh, setting up for a startup, you probably need that. Uh, on some other occasions, when the customer is fairly certain that what they need and that the requirements are are set uh, and understood well, then this might not be the way uh, way to go. So this for is sure. kind of a adding on another layer of uh, another opportunity for uh, for building something the the any system any complex system is actually built of many blocks so what you get with this you get to market really fast you get your product out there for other people to use and it's set of services so let's let's talk about our fleet tracking system so you build a server application in 72 clicks you have a database it's called cosmos db hosted in asia you don't even know you know what is it you have a web page that displays a power bi for and you have power bi to actually dis- visualize the data those are four or five completely separate systems and they work end to end and then your pro- solution becomes very popular you actually start to earn money with it then you can invest then you can hire a software engineers and they can go and for example okay say okay let's replace the server component with actual code to make it faster, to make it um, uh, whatever, like maintainable and what. So you just take this component that you initially generated with 72 mouse clicks, you have an army of engineers, they go and create solid server. But the rest of the system still works as a power app or power platform. Then you say, okay, now database. I want to have, because of data sovereignty or whatever, I want to have data on premise or in my company and whatnot. Cool. All system still works. You take the cloud-based database, you you know migrate it to your whatever is preferred solution. User still user service. It's still working. Then a product manager comes and says, "Hey, the the UI template that you use doesn't actually reflect our colors. Our our uh, hero color is pink and the portal is green. You know." And and then you have okay, fair, but the product is alive. And potentially, if you got to product management, it means that business is working. Then you get front-end engineers, and they work on the website. Once website is finished, you replace your component. And at this point onward, this is like five years into your successful company, you don't have any trace of power platform. While you did it, you know, you replaced all the parts of a moving car safely. You know, and, and it's beautiful, actually. So, so that's your transition to becoming a corporation or transition to becoming a software industry, the software company. Like you started as a as a transportation company that didn't even have an IT department, but because of automation that you built and and customer satisfaction, because you didn't have failures, like you were notified when 
vans are late, you know, you got opportunity to develop a system and eventually became a service provider, full blown. You know. While and do it while you know keeping up your business throughout the time, you never had a downtime, and your time to market was like really fast. Wonderful vision. However, what are the some of the places where you 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 have stumbled? You know, you have found okay, this doesn't work like that, or. I I have to rethink this this whole the whole low low code no code thingy. Uh, so where do people get stuck? We already mentioned the the sort of AI data generation is a problem, right? Because the data is, mm-hmm. is really necessary to train the models. What else? So so I'm a, a like a forerunner of the technology. Like I I I take the latest on the stack uh, uh, and see what can be built with it. Uh, and and things I stumbled upon is actually I was lacking functionality uh, to do while it was in the making. So so for example, when we talked about object detection, so so that's that's where I stumbled. I had form recognition at the time. I was like, but you know my cat doesn't fit in a form. Uh, so 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 then, then I saw hints of like, hey, well, actually object detection is coming to power. Why? Because object detection was available in something called Microsoft Cognitive Services. That's AI as a service. Like the, it's meant for anyone that is not a data scientist to utilize AI. And, and I was like, well, I can use it in, in the full code environment, uh, but that's not my goal. Why? Because I don't actually have time uh, to, deal, to deal with it in the way I want. So, so the 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 biggest problems i've encountered is that uh, the the items that i know are available through full coding experience but kind of were not exposed in this uh, low code environment that i focused on for my personal projects um uh, and and that's it and other items are around ai basically in different projects it's about uh, how to recognize the the even in the projects where I have the data, because I am not a data scientist, uh, it's about how to uh, recognize what is correct outcome and what is good outcome and bad outcome. I'm struggling with this because of uh, not being a data scientist. Even in a pet project that I'm current, like my weekend project at the moment, uh, is to understand the data without having this uh, big knowledge. Okay, maybe it would be also but beneficial. But they are a bit, a bit scientific approaches. <laughs> okay, <laughs> more beneficial than... to throw some uh, platforms here as well. So Microsoft Power Apps uh, was mentioned already in multiple locations. Uh, in terms of Microsoft offering, uh, you mentioned cognitive services. There was something mm-hmm. else. Yeah, so cognitive services, there is also um, Power Automate. Uh, Power Automate is for server-based code. Basically, you can you can automate your invoices. Uh, when an invoice comes, even in a paper form, Power Automate can recognize what's the date, approve it or not approve it. You can even automate purchases, like you know, you go and fill in the forms on partners' uh, request forms automatically based on your invoice. There is a uh, so that's Power Apps is for creating applications themselves. Power Automate and Logic Apps are creating backend, they're basically creating server code. Uh, Power BI is for visualizing data, if you are not a data scientist. Uh, and there is, uh, uh, and that's it. There is also Power Assistant or something like this is called, it's uh, basically for creating a conversation interface with your backend system. It's very exciting, but it, this is now the, the edge of the high tech range. Uh, Meaning you know, we need to figure out how to use it, uh, and and that's the that's the power platform. Like all of those product products are under a single umbrella called uh, power platform, and they're meant uh, to to extend each other. Work, mm-hmm. I think uh, they, they work a lot standalone, but work beautiful together. Yeah, I think that you have been using uh, Google tools, Google App Maker, uh, and Zapier. Yeah, Zapier and, and Google App Script actually more, uh, but uh, there are very good templates, so it doesn't take a computer uh, or developer to figure out how the sc- uh, script works. Uh, what, fun fact, uh, uh, when I started to build one um, Google Sheet-based uh, front-end, 
uh, uh, and I was in the building process and uh, Google broke their Sheets API for a day. And uh, the storm in the Google support forums was just immense. There was like 3,000 posts uh, under this uh, thread where it turned out that many people have built their website content management based on the Google Sheets. So you give the field name and uh, the value and uh, basically everything is, uh, you don't have any other backend than just Google Sheets. The, the response time or loading time is a little bit uh, slower, but it's but it basically you, you feel <laughs> like you are using internet in, uh, in, well, using US pages in Asia, for example, have the same feeling, but it freaking works and it doesn't cost anything, <laughs> which is the most important thing. Um, and you need, didn't need to be a software engineer to create it. That's exactly, exactly, yes. Then, yeah, other interesting uh, platform that I haven't yet uh, tried out is Parabola. It's uh, something new. Uh, there is also interesting stuff related to visualization called Kumu. Um, and uh, AppSheet uh, is mentioned also on a, as one of the sort of... A, Low code, no code, uh, application grade uh, creation environments. But uh, just to reflect back and go to the very beginning of the episode, actually, it is ironic that I was already doing low code, no code development with a platform called Action Request System by Remedy in 96, 97. So it was basically a three-tier uh, solution, a fat client, uh, app server, and database. Uh, but the uh, app server basically masked the database completely, and uh, you created uh, form-based applications, so like workflow applications, uh, databases, etc., with uh, just uh, drag and drop, and then the adding some filters and uh, actions to the fields and buttons and whatnot. And then deployed that as a as an application uh, that people consumed via fast client. So, uh, well, Remedy it didn't end up well for Remedy. Uh, too for, soon. Uh, too soon, and I I <laughs> think uh, uh, the company went bankrupt because there was a bookkeeping scam uh, that management uh, allowed yeah, to happen. Yeah, that's bad usually as well. <laughs> so so trust but the must platform, be founded on trust. <laughs> the platform actually got purchased by by Peregrine and Peregrine went under and then now I think BMC has it. So uh, I haven't checked where it's today, but uh, I know it still exists. So, I mean, uh, the, which leads me to maybe another episode topic, which is uh, fourth generation programming languages. Uh, right yes. now we had sort of a third generation and uh, that creates a high barrier of entry and uh, with low code, no code, we are getting uh, rid of that barrier of entry, but uh, but actually the, the, the whole um, web coding and, and uh, native coding uh, is evolving as well. So if there are someone uh, who could enlighten us and our listeners about fourth generation languages uh, then and also additional low code no code platform solutions um, that uh, they have had good experiences with uh, please uh, share your stories at algorithm facebook page and uh, kind of sh share your knowledge there as well yep so, uh, Matea, any any last comments from you, or you can... so so to wrap up, it's like call to action to, to our listeners. Actually, uh, so regardless of your background, regardless of your knowledge, what I invite you is to go to this episode's uh, webpage and take a look at resources. So so invest a bit of time. That's all that's needed. Uh, go through the Find My Cat tutorial. It takes only a couple of hours but you will get precious knowledge. You will actually figure out how to use AI, <laughs> even though you, know, you are really not in this industry and, and you know, regardless of what is your main occupation. And then once you finish this tutorial, 
instead of sending an email, you can interact with your home smart home. You have you know, smart light bulbs more maybe. Or instead of training to recognize your cat, you can recognize your car coming on the driveway and then smart home open the gate. That's that's the idea behind it. And then once you finish find my cat, if it seemed interesting or if it seemed exciting, then switch to the more complex tutorial. Uh, that's this location tracking with Garmin, sports location tracking with Garmin. It's, it takes more than a couple of hours, but you can probably finish it in maybe a day or two. But you will then get the understanding of end-to-end solution. Like you will, you will have, you know, server app built into in 72 mouse clicks. You will have database that you never even knew you, you could operate on. You will visualize your data in a user-friendly manner and maybe even build a mobile app to upload photos during your run. Uh, awesome. And all the samples are, you know, kind of, you, you don't need hardware. You know, I provided the uh, links where, where you yep. can take the track data from and, and stuff like this. And we, so we have those links uh, in, in our show notes as well. So we, we have those links. We're going to share them. Very cool. So Let's thank you, Matt. Uh, That's call to action. Are... Thank you very much, uh, Preet and Teet. Uh, thank you for hosting me. And uh, to our listeners, uh, thank you very much for for time uh, you spent uh, listening. I hope you enjoy. And that's a wrap. Ja meie kuulete veel üleskutse, et, et ootame endiselt uh, võimalik esinejaid teemasid, et uh, antke ennast üles, antke sõber üles, <laughs> et, et seda uh, algoritmi edasi arendada, et uh, eks me ise teeme ka siin taustal tööd, aga, aga tihti peale episoodid, kus inimesed räägid, tulevad räägivad oma kogemustest, oma lugudest, on, on need, mis saavad kõige rohkem ja nii-öelda kuulajaid ja, ja on kõige populaarsed. Positiivselt tagasi et... Täpselt. Sellega tänaseks kõik ja kohtume jälle järgmisel nädalal. Kuulmisene.